We're going to continue our study on the life of Peter, and we have certainly seen how he has been touched by the Master's hand. That's been the title of this sermon series, and we are at sermon number six, looking at Peter's life. Today, we're going to look at Luke's version of what might be described as a mountaintop experience that Peter, along with James and John, had with Jesus. Now, let me get started this way. How many of you would ever say that you had a mountaintop experience? Now, here's what I mean by that. Mountaintop experiences are those moments in our lives when we kind of feel God's presence in a very powerful way, a way we don't normally experience his presence. Now, there's all kinds of ways this could happen. Perhaps for you, one of those moments came when you were in this beautiful, inspiring place. Maybe you were on a mountaintop. Maybe you were at the ocean. Maybe you were able to visit the Grand Canyon or some of the other wonderful places that God created for us to enjoy. I know for me, two examples that I've had in my life, I was able on our 25th wedding anniversary to go to Hawaii. And I remember driving from the airport in Maui to our room, which is about 20 miles away, and Debbie kept saying, would you pull off before you wreck the car? Because I had never seen anything so beautiful in all my life. I stopped three times to take pictures before we ever got to the room. That's how beautiful it was. I've had many opportunities to be in the Smoky Mountains. And they just show the glory and the majesty of God. To me, that's a mountaintop experience. Or maybe you have had your mountaintop experience in a moment of crisis. Maybe in a hospital room. Maybe through praying. You don't know how a bill is going to get paid. You don't know where you're going to find your next job or a place to live. But then all of a sudden, God came through. You felt his peace. He stepped in and he miraculously provided what you needed. Those moments are precious to us. In today's story about the life of Peter, we're going to witness Peter, James, and John as they literally have a mountaintop experience. Now, let me give you a brief background before we look into Luke's version of this story in chapter 9. It had been about a week after the story from Peter's life that we looked at last week. Now, you remember, Peter actually rebuked Jesus. When Jesus revealed to his apostles he was going to have to go to Jerusalem, suffer and die, and then be raised again. Peter meant well. But he did not yet understand God's plan for the salvation of the whole world. And so Jesus rebuked Peter, even calling him Satan, because Jesus knew who was behind the comments Peter was making. Peter was still learning. He was still growing. And we're going to see some more growing pains even in today's story. But what was the purpose of this event that both Matthew and Mark refer to as the transfiguration of Jesus. And I talked about that a little bit in my bulletin uh, article for today. But how did this help Peter, James, and John? And how will it help us? What can we learn from this story, this mountaintop experience that Peter had? Well, those are just some of the questions we're going to answer right after we ask God for his help, as we always do. Let's go to him in prayer before we open up his word. Father, it's our privilege each time you give us this opportunity to open your word. And Lord, today we're going to take a look at another story in Peter's life. A story that was a miraculous story. A story that he, James, and John were able to experience on top of that mountain when Jesus was transfigured. When Moses and Elijah appeared and when God declared Jesus to be the chosen one. And that they were to listen to him now. Oh, Lord, help us to learn and grow from this passage today that we might realize Jesus is still the one we are to be listening to. And we thank you for your word, which teaches us all the truths that you want us to learn. Lord, as always, I need your help to present this message in a way that will be pleasing to you. May it be encouraging and challenging to all who are here and all who are watching. And we're going to give you the praise. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to talk about Peter's mountaintop experience, and that begins Luke chapter 9, verse 28 
which we're told this. About eight days after these sayings, so it was eight days after what we talked about last week, he, Jesus, took along Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. Now let me stop here just to say what I've already said several times during this sermon series. I want you to notice the reason Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. It was to pray. Jesus was committed to praying, and we should be too. Then verse 29 continues, While he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. The Hebrew writer tells us, chapter 1, verse 3, that Jesus, as the Son of God, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Now, that word glory carries with it the idea of glowing brilliance. When the angels visited the shepherds outside of Bethlehem on the night when Jesus was born, the Bible says in Luke 2, verse 9, that the glory of the Lord shone around them. Brilliant light is associated with the character and the nature of God. And that leads me to the first point about this mountaintop experience. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in a much different way than they had ever seen him. I think Paul gives us a little insight into this, chapter 2 of Philippians, verses 6 and 7. He's talking about Jesus comparing what he had in heaven to what he did when he came to earth. Here's what he writes. He, Jesus, already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. Now here's what Paul is saying here. Jesus had the form of God when he was in heaven. But now he willingly assumed the form of a bondservant or a slave. He took on a body like ours, So he could come to earth and accomplish the purpose for which God sent him. But here on this mountain, Luke says Jesus became different. Now I want to drop down to the beginning of verse 32 because it tells us what they saw. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. God was showing these three a glimpse of the glory that Jesus once had and now has again, according to John chapter 17. Jesus is now at the throne of God, and he has his glory there. This was the physical evidence to this point that Jesus was divine. He was indeed the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He was flashing forth in this brilliant brightness and what we need to understand is someday we're going to be transformed to be like him that's what John said first John 3 verse 2 here's what he writes beloved now we are children of God and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be we know that when he appears we will be like him because we will see him just as he is we're going to see him someday in his glorious form And then we're going to become like him in the sense that we're going to have new bodies and we too are going to have our glorious body just like Jesus has. Now it's interesting that both John and Peter used this mountaintop experience later in their writings. John wrote in John 1 verse 14, we saw his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He was referring to that moment, that mountaintop experience. Peter wrote, 2 Peter 1, verse 16, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He, too, was referring to that mountain where they saw Jesus transfigured before them. So as the glory of God was glowing from Jesus on the mountain, another remarkable miracle took place. Moses and Elijah appear. 
representing all that the Old Testament law and prophets stood for. Let's read verses 30 and 31. Luke writes, And behold, two men were talking with him, Jesus, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory, so they also appeared in their glorious form, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, I think it's also interesting that both Moses and Elijah had mountaintop experiences when they lived here on earth. Now, we know Moses' mountaintop experience is when he was on Mount Sinai, and what did God do? He gave him the Ten Commandments. Remember that? That was his mountaintop experience. Elijah's mountaintop experience came on Mount Carmel when he had a showdown with 450 false prophets of Baal and defeated them by God's power. But the question is, why were Moses and Elijah on the mountain this particular day? Well, Luke says... They had come to talk with Jesus about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I believe they were there to tell Jesus he was on the right path, to encourage him to continue. We know later in the Garden of Gethsemane, an angel would be sent to strengthen Jesus in the moments before his arrest. But now it was Moses and Elijah who God chose from his eternal world standing there beside Jesus, assuring him of the Father's sustaining help and the glory that would be accomplished through his sacrifice on the cross. Now, meanwhile, all this is going on, and what do you think Peter, James, and John are doing? Sleeping. They were asleep. Look at verse 32 again. I want to read it in its entirety. Now Peter and his companions have been overcome with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw his glory, meaning Jesus, and the two men who were standing with him, Moses and Elijah. So put yourself in these three guys' place. They go up in the mountain to pray with Jesus. But just like what later happened in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night Jesus was arrested, they fell asleep. Now, I don't know why this was true. Maybe it took them all day to climb the mountain. Maybe it was nighttime, and when nighttime came, sleep overcame them. Now, I realize the Bible doesn't say that this occurred at night, but it seems likely to me that it did, because when the entire episode is over, Luke records for us in verse 37, he said, on the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met them. What that means to me is they were up on the mountain all night, And I can just imagine how much more impressive this whole scene would have been at night. I mean, here they are, they're praying in the dark. Peter, James, and John fall into this deep sleep. And then they were suddenly awoken by this brilliant light and the voices of Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, I couldn't help but think this as I'm reading this. How many times have we ever been startled? We've been awoken very quickly at night. Maybe the phone rings at night. Maybe a thunderstorm and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you wake up, and it takes a moment, doesn't it, for your mind to get clear. Think what that must have been like for Peter, James, and John. They wake up to this dazzling, miraculous scene. And maybe they're thinking to themselves, okay, we're in, where are we here? Oh, yeah, we're on the mountain. We're, we're praying with Jesus. But why is he shining like a star? And who's Jesus talking with? Oh, yeah, that's Moses and Elijah. What? Moses and Elijah, they probably thought they were still dreaming. It's not surprising that Peter, in his usual speak first, think later style, would say the wrong thing. We're told in verse 33, and as these two men were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. And let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. So Peter begins here with the obvious. It is good that we are here. Yes, it was. It's no wonder Peter wanted to stay there. I would have wanted to stay there too. As if Peter was saying, wow, this this is incredible, and I'm sure it was. This is a glorious moment. Let's preserve it. But then he makes a wrong suggestion. 
He said, let's build a tent. Let's build a shrine. Let's build a tabernacle for all three of you. Let's just hang out here for as long as we can because this is absolutely wonderful. It doesn't get any better than this. It was obvious. Peter didn't completely understand Jesus' role as a Messiah or Savior because he was equating Moses and Elijah with Jesus in authority. He was talking when he should have been listening and learning. The apostles were to know that Jesus' kingdom was a spiritual one and that he had come to fulfill the law represented by Moses and the prophets represented by Elijah. Jesus needed to go to Jerusalem to be crucified and to be resurrected. Moses and Elijah needed to return to their eternal residence, their ministry in heaven. Peter's wrong suggestion didn't need to be corrected by Jesus, Moses, or Elijah because God the Father stepped in. He made the correction. Look at verses 34 and 35. But while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And then a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. In other words, the important person here on top of the mountain is not Moses and it's not Elijah. The most important person here is Jesus. God was showing these three apostles that Jesus is the one you should listen to now. The words that matter most are not the law or the prophets. They had their purpose. They are still important. But the one that's most important is Jesus. And I want you to listen to his words. And then just as quickly as all this happened, the transfiguration of Jesus, the appearance of Moses and Elijah, the cloud and the voice of God, it all disappeared. Verse 36 says, And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. Now the reason they didn't say anything is because of what we read in Matthew's version of this story. Chapter 17 verse 9 says, When they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And I can just imagine this was a scary yet exciting moment, this mountaintop experience that Peter, James, and John had. I mean, can you imagine seeing what they saw, hearing what they heard? They saw Jesus glowing with the glory of God. They saw Moses and Elijah who were supposed to be dead. They had heard Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus about the crucifixion which was to come. And they had heard the voice of God declaring that Jesus was his beloved son, that he was the chosen one, and they were to now listen to him. And I think it's obvious as to why Jesus told them to keep all this to themselves until after the resurrection. Can you imagine the chaos it would have caused both among the other disciples and among the crowds of followers and the critics? This powerful truth about the identity of Jesus needed to be shared at the right time and prior to the crucifixion and resurrection was not the right time to share it. So that's the mountaintop experience that Peter, James, and John had, but now it's time for some applications. What lessons can we learn from today's segment in Peter's training as a disciple? Now, I couldn't help but, but think about this. Maybe the first lesson we need to learn is don't sleep while you, you're praying. <laughs> I don't know about you, but there have been times I've been praying and I've fallen asleep before. Have you been there? I've fallen asleep before. But I, that's really not one of the lessons. I just had to say that. Seriously, the first lesson we learned from today's story is this. We need to see Jesus for who he really is. In order for us to see Jesus in his glory, we need to visit the mountaintop. Now, please understand what I'm saying here. When I say we need to visit the mountaintop, 
I am using that phrase figuratively, not literally. Jesus is not found just on the top of a mountain. What I am suggesting to you is that every single one of us at times in our lives, we need to pull ourselves away from the hustle and the bustle of everyday life and we need to draw closer to Jesus. We need those quiet times with our Savior. And as we have seen on many occasions, this is something Jesus did regularly to draw closer to God his Father. In today's story, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to that mountaintop to pray. And when we seek Jesus in our quiet place, when we're worshiping or praying, when we're involved in our Bible study time, we will experience the power of God's presence. But as we seek God through Jesus in this way, we must be careful. Because there are many competing voices in this world in which we live in, people who will try to lead us away from Jesus. And as we saw in last week's sermon, Satan can speak through anyone to lead us away from God's will. We must seek Jesus in the kinds of places where he has told us to look for him. So where do we look for Jesus? Well, first and foremost, we look for him in his word. And I put in your outline, I'm not going to read it today, but I put in there, Revelation 1, 12 through 16. That is John's vision of Jesus on his heavenly throne. And what a great vision it is. I want to encourage you to go home today and read that. Revelation 1, 12 through 16. So we go to the Bible, we find many references to who Jesus is there. We seek him in prayer. We seek him in his glorious creation. God has made himself known through his glory of his creation. So let me ask you this question. Just how do you see Jesus today? Unfortunately, many people are looking for him in all the wrong places. I was reading some stories this week, the first one. It's about a housewife in New Mexico who was frying tortillas on her stove. One of them burned, and the burn formed what she thought was the shape of a face. So she decided it must be the face of Jesus. So she took it to her priest, and she asked him, Do you think this tortilla looks like Jesus? He said, Well, yes, I do. So the priest blessed the tortilla. He'd never blessed a tortilla before, but he blessed this tortilla. Now, I've always been baffled. As to how anyone can have any idea of what Jesus looked like. There was no photography then. There was no one who painted a picture of Jesus, although many people have tried. Well, after the priest blessed the tortilla, the housewife took it home. She put it in a little box. She surrounded it with white cotton so it would look like it was floating on a cloud. And then she and her husband built an altar and began to pray before it. The news spread, and soon thousands of people were coming to see and pray before this burned tortilla. That's a true story, by the way. In Poland, someone discovered a tree that had a strange shape in the bark. Now, the one who discovered it was a crippled man. He decided that this had to be the image of the Virgin Mary. Sixty miles away, another tree was discovered, and someone said, well, that looks like the other tree. So in Poland, thousands of people bought train tickets to go into the countryside, kneel before these two trees, leaving their money at the foot of the trees, and asking for the blessing of the Virgin Mary. Now, why do people do things like this? I believe it's because people desperately want to see and feel the glory and the power of God. And we should all want that. The problem is people look for it in all the wrong places. I read about another woman in Arkansas who thought she found Jesus in the kitchen light of her trailer. And she began to worship the light in her trailer. Listen, if you want to see God's glory, you don't need to go to a tortilla. You don't need to go to a tree. You don't need to go to a trailer. Here's where you need to go, right here. It's called the Word of God. And that's where we find the glory of Jesus. It's found in the word. 
So how do we see Jesus? Do we see him as only a great prophet? Do we see him only as a good moral man who died a martyr's death? Now both of those things are true, but much more than that. Do we see Jesus as the only way to the Father? I hope we do. Because just how we see Jesus will determine what kind of disciple we're going to be for him. So the first lesson from today's story, we need to visit the mountaintop and see Jesus for who he really is. That leads me to the second point we need to learn. We must listen to Jesus because everything he says is totally true and in harmony with God's purpose. That was the endorsement that God gave to him on the mountain to Peter, James, and John. He said in verse 35, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And I believe this command rep represents the whole point of this mountaintop experience. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us God is still speaking through Jesus today and we need to listen to him. Are you listening? Jesus is speaking through his word. Are you listening? I read about this 80-year-old grandfather who went to his daughter's house for Sunday dinner. And when the meal was over, he said, I'm going to take a walk through the neighborhood. He said, I'll only be gone about 15 or 20 minutes. Two hours later, he wasn't back, and they were getting worried about him. And all of a sudden, he shows up at the door. He says, I'm so sorry. He said, I stopped to talk to an old friend, and he just wouldn't stop listening. <laughs> now, I can imagine that there are times in our lives when we want to stop listening to people, <laughs> right? I mean, there may be times you might want to stop listening to your spouse, not me. <laughs> but there may be times. <laughs> there may be times you, you might want to stop listening to your friends or your boss at work, your neighbors, your coworkers. Maybe you don't want to listen to them, but let me give you some advice. Never stop listening to Jesus. Never stop. Keep listening to what he has to say to you. And if you're in his word, I want you to realize he's telling you, get rid of that sin in your life. Study and pray so you can be more effective in your service. Are you listening to Jesus? And for all of you here today who are not yet Christians, Jesus is telling you this. Come to me. Be saved. Be set free from the burden of sin and death. Are you listening to Jesus? I hope that you are. Third lesson we can learn today is we need to leave the mountaintop and serve others. Now you'll notice Peter wanted to stay on the mountain. That's the danger of the mountaintop experience. I don't blame him for wanting to stay. But we don't need to linger there. We have work to do for the Lord. And the only way I could illustrate this was to think about going on vacation. How many times you go on vacation and you say to yourself, man, I don't want to go back yet. Right? I'd like to stay on vacation for a while. I'm not looking forward to going back to work. I'm not looking forward to going back to school. We wish we could be on vacation permanently. Listen, it's important for us to regularly go to the mountaintop but we can't stay there. We must return to the valley in order to serve God by serving others. Now, we can have these wonderful spiritual highs, and they are important. But we can also feel God's closeness when we're sharing our faith and we're serving others. What an awesome feeling it is to know that we have been used by God to accomplish his purposes. I believe it is in sharing and in serving that we are stretched beyond our own power and wisdom and we begin to depend more on God's power and wisdom. Disciples of Jesus will sometimes struggle as we follow and serve our Lord. And I know I have on many times, many occasions. Sometimes we may feel like we've worked hard. Sometimes we may feel like we've been faithful in whatever ministry God has given to us but with little results, and we get frustrated. We get discouraged. We get disappointed, and Jesus knows that, and that's why he takes us to the mountaintops. 
just like he did for Peter, James, and John. Mountaintop experiences reveal Jesus' glory. And I just want to testify to you today that I've had my share of mountaintop experiences in my life. And I will confess to you, they keep me going in the rough times. I mean, just preaching the gospel every week is a high point for me. I look forward to this. But those times when I see someone respond to the truth of the gospel, it is unspeakable joy. I mean, I'll never forget how I felt. That day I came out of the baptistry at the North Terrace Church of Christ in May of 1978, and my sins were forgiven. And that guilt that I had was gone because of what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget my mom calling me telling me that she had been immersed into Christ in Lake Isabel in East Fulton, Fultonham. I won't forget that day. I'll never forget the opportunities that God has given to me to be able to baptize others into Christ or to see others being baptized into Christ. The sensation is always the same. Another soul has been won to the Lord. I've had the privilege of being at the bedside with many families of faithful Christians who go home to be with the Lord and they share tears mixed with profound celebration. I've been the recipient of much generosity from brothers and sisters in Christ. I've witnessed Christians suffer with this indescribable joy in their hearts. And I've seen God heal people who would otherwise not be healed. I've seen prayers answered and lives transformed as Jesus becomes their Lord and Savior. Now, that's just a short list, but it's a priceless list of what God has given to me and the mountaintop experiences that I've been able to share and have in my life. Now, I'm sure you've had those experiences before. Maybe you're thinking about them right now, and I hope that you are. I mean, they're unforgettable. There are these feelings of goosebumps, spine tingling, elating, jaw dropping, tears of joy producing deeply satisfying, overflowing, miraculous moments. Moments to live for. Moments in which we know for certain that we've been with Jesus and we will never be the same. So as the praise team comes this morning, let's be sure we spend enough time on the mountaintop with God so that we experience his glory and allow him to transform us. Then we'll be ready to spend enough time in the valley in service to others.